spent the next few weeks in the forest writing music. The house was completely off-grid, so it ran on a generator and came with the usual slew of issues. So the first night here, a uh, pipe burst um, for the water heater. Uh, but that wasn't that big of a deal. It's to be expected with a house in the middle of a rainforest. It was still an incredible place to dive into my music. About three weeks in, I went up to the city with my friend Johnny, who had flown in to shoot some footage for the documentary. When we finished up and walked back out to the car, my heart dropped onto the pavement. I've never felt such a painfully accurate example of lidoszt, a Polish word for this feeling one gets when confronted with an immense, negative, and absolute breach of the order we expected the world to have. Lidoszt is what you feel the moment you find out that what should absolutely not happen has unequivocally and unchangeably happened. Our car had been broken into and everything was gone. My computer, hard drives, equipment, everything. The equipment itself, that was bad and inconvenient, but I could eventually buy more. But with it went the entire album. The last three years of music before that, so much work. That alone would break my heart, but the thing that truly shattered it was this feeling like half of my life had just disappeared. See, I have a terrible memory. I always have. And yes, music is my primary method of emotional cleansing and catharsis, but it's also one of the main methods by which I remember my life. I can look back and see these moments of emotion from my life that have been captured and crystallized immediate and palpable. And just that alone would have broken me, but there was more. Another way I made up for my terrible memory was by taking pictures, tens of thousands of pictures and videos. From the ages of 18 to 26, I traveled far and wide and took photos of everything I did, literally every day for eight years documenting my life like a journalist, arranging them by date so I could look back and actually remember all the experiences that have shaped and molded me, all the people I've loved and their specific fingerprints. I wrote poetry alongside the photos about all my experiences so I could remember even more of the emotional component. It held every photo from every relationship I've been in, all the crazy adventures I had gone on that turned me into the person I am today, every formative moment of my life. I put so much time and care into making sure nothing and no one would be forgotten. Without it, my memories of the past were like a foggy haze. I got the general gist, but couldn't recall so many of the most colorful details. It was there with me throughout my entire adult life. And then, in an instant, it was gone. Lidoscht. An unchangeable, cataclysmic breach. Does it have the shit that you've been working on for this album? Probably not. No, 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 it got definitely nothing for this album. Okay, let's see, the last date that it was backed up is... November of 2016. Awesome. Uh, okay, there ago. is a chance. Nope, there's not. At the time, I couldn't even comprehend the enormity of the loss. I just felt like 80% of my body mass had just evaporated, like I was this vague outline. I thought there would be at least something. Like this whole time, I think the reason I was really freaking out I'm sure. At least backed up like a couple months ago. I knew. But like. I ended up dealing with it in the way I've dealt with most terrible things in my life. 
I dissociated. I called the police, filed a report. I wasn't hopeful, but I had to move forward. I got on Facebook to give everyone an update, but my spirit had already given up. Then, something happened. The message started getting spread around, and Chilean fans started getting involved. They contacted local news outlets, radio stations, and even sent messages to the personal Facebooks of local police officers. We went to the police. We went to the Chilean version of what, I guess, like the FBI. They announced it on the radio, all the stuff that's missing. Um, I got to meet the actual detectives in charge of everything at first. All of them had the message that I made on their phones already. They were like, are you Justin Phillips? And they showed me, oh, but they, they had like face, like personal Facebook messages from people. Um, so while, while I was there, he was heading out to go on the prowl. I was deeply touched. I was and still am so grateful to the people of Chile. It was beautiful. It did a lot for me, made me feel some hope. At the same time, I knew stolen items are rarely recovered. I wasn't under any illusions that this was gonna have some storybook ending. Then, as I was about to get back to the house, my phone lit up. So the, uh head of the investigation team in Valdivia just messaged me uh, telling me that I need to come to the police station right now. Uh, so I was in a different city, but I'm speeding down the road, um, heading there. He said they found a camera and they just need me to uh, like give the go on recognizing it so that they can go and get the other stuff. So. Uh, this could be pretty exciting. It was the PDI, the Chilean version of the FBI. They had taken on the case after seeing how much attention it was getting in the news. For the first time, I was starting to think that we might actually be able to get the stuff back. So I, uh, I'm almost there now and I just got another text from the head of the investigation saying that, uh, they know where all the rest of my stuff is, but for some reason the judge doesn't want to give them a court order to go there. Uh, um, so anyway, I'm heading there now. Hopefully I can beg them. I'm not sure. We'll see. Okay, let's see what happens. So finally, we had to take things into our own hands. I told the head of the group that I would be willing to get some money to grease some wheels if we needed it. He looked at me knowingly and we went to his office to chat. The plan was this. The cops would call the kids into the office and tell them how much jail time they were facing and how hopeless their situation seemed. Of, or, or freedom release, I don't know how the, do you say that? Yeah, yeah, freedom. If, uh, release, release. Really. Yes. Uh, if they help you in recovering uh, all your things or some of your things, mm -hmm. When everything seemed adequately dismal, they would pretend to get a phone call and tell the kids that I had just told them I was willing to make a generous offer. All charges dropped in exchange for the items, along with more money than they had probably ever had in their lives. One of them was going to go with me undercover, so I had to introduce him as my uncle's friend. I tried to film on my phone because I knew I would want to remember it later but I had to keep it hidden so I wouldn't make them suspicious. The money now is available. Some money. But something like $1,000. <laughs> $1,000. When I came into the room, the kids were already thanking me over and over, and they were distraught. Through a translator, I was able to find out that they worked for a large crime syndicate and stole things from cars all the time without thinking about it, but they had never seen the consequences up close. So, the operation began. So do we go to ATM first, or Red, Red Bank? No, first we are going to recover the laptop. Oh, oh, I see, okay. Then... The Valdivian crime syndicate is a complex beast, and in a strange way, it's actually pretty brilliant. They're searching the first house with her. The, 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 the things are in two houses. Uh -huh. They have systems in place specifically designed to make items as difficult to recover as possible. 
The street kids take the items, they hand them off to actual syndicate members, and those members hand them off to others. One more. So this is someone else's house? Yeah, I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sometimes up to 15 handoffs for any given item. Needless to say, we had our work cut out for us. Over the next two days, we spent a combined total of 12 hours driving around the Chilean slums, from trap house to trap house, back alley to back alley, while the kids called and texted everyone involved, trying to track the items without raising suspicion. You have the money? I have the, the um, 250. Yes. We drove around to various meeting spots, giving one of the kids money to take to the syndicate member while we kept the other kid in the car as a collateral. At each step, the syndicate member would reveal who they had passed it off to next. The things were moved from the place, <coughs> uh, and they are trying to, <coughs> to ask <coughs> where the things are now. It was interesting and almost exciting for the first little bit, until a few hours in when one of the exchanges got heated and I saw the undercover officer reach for the pistol he had concealed under his shirt, crouching, on edge his hand on the door, ready for action. After that, it really sunk in. This was not a game. From that moment on, his hand was near his pistol for the majority of the time we were sitting outside different locations. He will talk tomorrow, tomorrow. Ag uh, again. The whole process was slow going because word had gotten out that a few kids had been picked up by the PDI. Everyone was jumpy agreeing to meet up, backing out, changing locations. The officer and I kept talking tons of shit about cops and how much we hated them, trying our best to keep all suspicion away. I will admit, it was pretty entertaining to watch a federal officer go on five-minute rants about all the terrible things he's done to cops who have tried to step to him. The next day was filled with more complex meeting places. The external hard disk uh, are available now for go and search them changing up over and over again, people getting sketched out, successful and unsuccessful bribes. The friend who has the, the laptop is scared. Eventually, we were able to recover my drone and a few hard drives, but unfortunately, they weren't the important ones. Late on the second night, after driving around all day, we finally had the most important piece of the puzzle the syndicate member that claimed to have my MacBook. Uh -huh. Please trust in me. I will uh, recover your laptop. I need 150,000. We ended up at an abandoned intersection in a dark part of town. I gave the kid $500 to trade for the laptop and he went a few streets over and got into a small black sedan. After half an hour of anticipation, we saw the door open. The kid emerged, holding nothing. He says that the laptop was sold to another city and they disable, how do you say, disable in parts uh -huh. to and sell the parts and there was no laptop. That's saying the, the, this guy. He says he can re, uh, uh, recover the drone and the cameras uh, tomorrow, sure, but the, the laptop, no way. Uh. I offered $1,000, I offered $1,500, but nothing could change it. It was truly gone. Very, very sorry, says. So now I am at Marcelo's house again. Uh, he's gonna let me borrow his Mac Mini so I can try to make as much stuff as possible before heading out. drove home in a haze. Halfway through the three hour drive, the exhaustion and rage finally hit me. I was screaming, cursing the world, angry at everything and everyone. Nothing made any fucking sense anymore. I just wanted to run away, escape, and have this whole nightmare of a situation behind me. I pulled over and started to look into changing my flight to leave the next day, but then, in the middle of the fury, and the sorrow, and the anguish, a truth rang out in my heart. All of a sudden, I knew deep in my soul that moments like these and the decisions you make in response become the foundation of your character and who you are as a human being. 
I made a decision in that moment that I would refuse to be defeated, that I would take all this shit, fill my lungs with it, and scream it back at the universe. I was going to write an album, no matter what it took. I got back to the cabin in a frenzy and immediately started making music, spinning and dancing around the space, making animalistic sounds, chugging wine, diving into delirium, channeling my sorrow into a sort of madness. I just didn't care anymore. I was fully open to the spirit of the forest, ready to make whatever dark, vengeful magic it desired. Yeah.